the Canon C200, the EOS R, and the Zcam E2. Three cameras that probably shouldn't be compared, but today, let's take a look at them because unfortunately, I'm saying goodbye to my baby, the C200. Hey, this is Scott and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you for watching and please consider subscribing to see more content in the future. I will have a lot more content coming on this camera right here, the Zcam E2, as well as the Zcam E2 F6 when it's released in the fall, and maybe even some more content on this camera right here, the EOS R. But sadly, I've decided it's time for me to part with my beloved C200. Uh, so today, I just wanna talk a little bit about kind of what led me to that decision. I'm not going to say that any of these cameras are better or worse than any of the other ones, and I'm not gonna go in depth to talking about which one has better image quality or things like that, uh, which one has better noise performance. Uh, those things, I think, you know, are gonna depend a lot on the user, depend a lot on the scene, and a whole lot more. But today, I just wanna talk about some of the factual differences between these cameras and kind of how they play into different uh, applications and why this may be necessary for some people, but for other people, it just may not be. And the EOS R or the Zcam E2 or a combination of those or a combination of other cameras could cover those bases that the C200 uh, may do well, but may also not be necessary for. So I'm going to break this video into some parts to organize it just a little bit. Uh, and I'll put the kind of timeline on screen and also down in the video description. So if you want to jump ahead or jump back and forth between different sections, feel free to do that. But for now, let's get into it. So the C200 shoots up to 4K and 60 frames per second in either 12 or 14 bit RAW, depending on your frame rate, or in 8 bit codecs, MP4 or XFAVC codecs, uh, and nothing in between. There's no way to get a higher quality video out over HDMI or SDI, so you're stuck with those recording modes. The MP4 and XFAVC files here are pretty robust, definitely more so than on a lot of other cameras. There's kind of, I don't know, some little Canon magic in there, uh, but still it is a limitation unless you're shooting RAW which is you know, a whole different workflow and whether or not that's practical for you is gonna depend on the type of work that you do. There's also 120 frames per second in 1080p, but I personally hate the way it looks and I avoid it at all costs, especially if you're trying to mix it with 4K footage. The E2, on the other hand, can shoot in 4K up to 120 frames per second or 160 frames per second if you crop it vertically to a 2.4 to one ratio. That's in H.265, which is still 10-bit, but you also have ProRes 422LT up to 72 frames per second. You have standard ProRes 422 up to 60 frames per second, and you have ProRes 422HQ up to 30 frames per second in 4K. Raw video is also coming soon. They said it's coming this month, but for now it's not in there, so we're gonna leave it out of the question. With the E2, you can also get up to 240 frames per second in 1080p, but honestly, it doesn't look that great, so we're not gonna talk about it here either. ProRes on the E2 edits like butter on my Mac. It's just no problem to cut through that and edit and play it back with no problems whatsoever. Uh, depending on the codec, the HQ for example, it can be a little bit heavier, but you do have some options and I love having that flexibility. In the higher frame rates, the 120, the 160, you can definitely see some ugly noise at times, but if you expose it correctly, you can definitely get rid of a lot of that and noise reduction software can easily clean up most of it uh, that's left over after that. 72 frames per second is super clean though, and that combined with the fact that you can record it in ProRes just makes it absolutely a dream to record in, and it's still slower slow motion than the C200 can do. With all that said, like I mentioned in the opening of this video, I'm not going to comment much deeper on the actual image quality. Both of these cameras do fantastically in that. Uh, the colors are great on both of these cameras and the footage is really, really easy to grade. High ISO noise performance is also pretty great. Uh, some people have been curious kind of how the actual exposure values of the ISO um, values uh, compare from the E2 to another camera because the E2 does have dual native ISO at 500 and 2500. But some people are curious, you know, does that 2500 equate to 2500 on a camera like the C200? So uh, just to kind of draw a comparison between that, not in terms of actual performance, I'm just going to see where uh, the exposure of a gray card falls uh, at 2500 with, you know, the same settings on both of these cameras. And I'll show that on screen now, so just so you can see if 2500 is actually, you know, the low light performance that you would get out of the C200 at the same settings. Dynamic range in RAW on the C200 is of course gonna be a bit better. And of course you get that 12 or 14 bit codec uh, with RAW footage here. And that's gonna be you know a bit more robust. It's gonna have a bit more latitude than the Zcam will when you need it. 
However, uh, RAW is coming to this camera as well, so we'll see how that performs. And even the standard dynamic range of the E2 is better than a lot of the other cameras in the market, and there are a couple of modes that can even stretch that a little bit further if you're careful about what you're shooting and how you're shooting it to avoid things like artifacts that can come into play when you shoot in those special modes. ZCam does also have that S6, uh, F6, and F8 Super 35 and full frame sensor cameras coming soon, so we'll see those should have a bit more dynamic range than the E2, and those will kind of compete even more uh, strongly against something like the C200. So I'm really excited to see how the performance is out of those compared to this, and you know, retrospectively at that point, uh, compared to the C200. Now, the C200 is not a huge camera, especially for a cinema camera with so much power packed into it, but it's not necessarily small either, and it's not necessarily the easiest form factor to uh, rig up either on a shoulder rig or on a gimbal, for example. Just the kind of form factor makes it a little bit difficult, and of course me having the standard C200, not the B version, makes it even a little bit more difficult. On a shoulder rig, you have the fan blowing in your ear most of the times, and sometimes it can be difficult to get it balanced or centered on your shoulder. You need to add like a heavy V-mount battery in the back as a counterweight oftentimes to kind of make it work, and uh, if you're using it on a gimbal, you can sometimes get by with you know smaller, uh, I guess you could say budget-friendly, uh, lower-priced gimbals, but definitely if you're planning on using this on a gimbal a lot, something that's a lot more expensive and uh, larger and stronger is going to be better for you. And even at that point, you're probably going to want to start considering something like uh, Easy Rig, or you know if you're using a glide cam. Again, a vest and an arm system is going to be more and more necessary. And just it's kind of in that awkward area where you can get by with a smaller and lighter and cheaper setups, but it definitely benefits from having a bigger budget to spend on things like larger, more robust gimbals and support systems. The E2, on the other hand, is tiny, and I mean really, really tiny. And just generally speaking, the form factor here makes it a lot easier to use with things like small or medium sized gimbals or even small sliders throw a thin HDMI cable on there and it's very easy to rig up an external monitor if you're using it on a gimbal or you know any other setup that you need to really minimize the footprint of the camera itself. I did talk about the EVF a little bit and how it can sometimes get in the way. It's a little bit awkward sticking out the back of the camera and that's not always an ideal location to have it anyway. But the fact is that there is an EVF built into this body which means that if you have an absolute minimal minimalist setup here, you can still see in uh, outdoor bright conditions by using just this EVF and you re retain all of the functions of the camera itself. And also if you don't want the EVF, they do have the B version available for a lower price. On top of that though, the C200 has a lot of controls and buttons and dials built into the body itself which let you take control of you know, any settings, you can change parameters, you can navigate the menu, you can uh, change you know, your aperture, your ISO, you can do a lot on the fly without having to dive into any menu systems whatsoever. I will love and miss this on the C200, however, despite the minimalist design of the E2 body, it's actually pretty easy to navigate and there's a decent amount of buttons that you can customize to what works best for you, so so long as you have some time to use the camera and find out what functions you use the most and then you can program those to those custom function buttons, you can actually get by quite well with just the buttons on the body. However, if you combine it with something like this BM5 here, you can use this as a touch screen interface for the entire menu system. And at that point, it just becomes lightning fast to navigate through the menu, which is also a pretty easy to use menu system. But you know, having this on here means you get touch screen capability just like a native LCD. And it kind of makes it really, really fast. And the side effect of this is that if you are using E2 on something like a gimbal and you have the monitor mounted off on the side of the handle, you can still retain that touchscreen uh, ability to navigate through the menu without having to touch the camera itself. Now, the only way to do that with the C200 is if you're using the native LCD, and that presents its own difficulties because the cable is thick and rigid and not all that long, so it makes it a little bit tricky to mount that LCD anywhere on the gimbal. It's also not that bright, not that large when you're starting to get into that type of setup. And if you want to replace Canon's cable with a longer one, goodbye money. The Canon C200 also does have built-in ND filters and really good ones at that. There are two wheels inside the body that will spin and combine either one or both of them to get up to 10 stops of ND in the body. And you can turn them completely off by just spinning those both to the space where there's no ND in that wheel. The E2 does not have NDs built in and I really, really miss that. 
To be honest though, if I'm shooting slow motion, I personally don't mind cranking the shutter speed a little bit to compensate that exposure. Uh, and the new E2, uh, S6, F6, and F8 will have END built in. It's not gonna be quite as perfect or versatile as the built-in filters here, especially because you can turn these completely off without having to take anything out. But still, it's much, much better than just having nothing like there is in this E2 at the moment. In the meantime though, I have been loving the Canon EOS R for running gun stuff and having that adapter with the built-in Vary ND has just made it so much easier to shoot on the go. It's not perfect, you know, the adapter itself, if you dial it all the way to the strongest setting, it will really mess up the image. Um, but right up until just before that, you can get quite a lot of ND in there. Uh, without you know really affecting the image much at all and you can dial it down fairly low uh, the little wheel on there to adjust it is stupid and small but still it's been amazing for running gun stuff for my personal use it's been more than enough and especially when you combine it with the atomos which i haven't done yet but i'm going to do it, it's just going to make a really really powerful combination for on the go stuff and even here in my studio in more controlled situations you're going to be able to get a really nice image out of that so that's kind of another big factor in why I'm getting rid of the C200. It's just the fact that the EOS R can do a lot of things that the C200 can do, and the E2 can do a lot of things that it can't do. But you know, kind of combining these two will cover most of my bases, and I can buy a Canon EOS R, the Atomos, and in the future, the E2 F6, all just by selling this and a couple accessories. So just for me and what my clients need, uh, it's gonna give me the most bang for the buck. And I'm not saying that it means that's a better choice. Uh, this may, again, depend on what you're shooting, who you're shooting for, uh, and what you need. But, you know, for me, it's just gonna be a much more logical choice. Anyway, getting off topic. There are also some stupid issues with the C200, like the fact that when you put a tripod plate on the bottom of there, there is a little bit of flex, even if you use two screws, it's kind of an annoying thing, and it has been noticeable in some cases, not a lot, and it's never really caused a huge problem, but it is noticeable. But, you know, the E2 is rock solid, especially if you put a cage on there. Also, every little accessory for the C200 is going to cost you a lot more than with the E2. And that's not to say it's super expensive, because when you compare it to accessorizing something like a RED, for example, this is still going to be really, really cheap. Um, but still, it's going to cost you a lot more than the E2. For example, the E2 can run on Sony MPF batteries, and I have in there like a $20 or $30 battery right now, which I can run on for four hours easily. So it's it's not hard to have those lying around, but you know, extra batteries for this are definitely going to cost you a lot more. Or you know, you can power it with V-mount power, but that's going to require a larger rig, and you know, things can add up very very quickly. On top of that, cheap HDMI cables here are going to save you a lot of money without losing any functionality of the camera. Whereas if you use HDMI in here, you are making some sacrifices by not having that touchscreen on there. And if you want to extend that cable, we talked about how expensive that's going to be. Plus, you don't have to do any kind of hack to use an SSD with this. So if you don't want to pay for CFast cards, you can record to an SSD with this without using any crazy hack, which some people don't want to have to do on the C200. Now, physically speaking, the connections on the back of the camera are going to be where there's a huge difference for some people and maybe no difference at all for other people. And on the Canon C200, you have SDI, uh, you have two full-size XLRs, you have timecode and so on, all built into the body. And with the E2, you don't. On the E2, you do get a USB-C, which you can use for either recording or for monitoring or controlling the camera with your phone. You get a mini XLR, which does provide phantom power. You get HDMI, and apparently there's going to be some sort of SDI adapter at some point, but that's not the same. And it's the same story for timecode. There will be an adapter at some point in the future, but again, it's not the same as having them all built into the body. Now, like I said, that's going to make a huge difference for some and absolutely none for others, and you probably know who you are. I'm personally not one of the people who it makes a significant difference from. I will miss the full-size XLRs and SDI, but that's not a deal breaker. This is one area that I will sorely miss from the C200. And anybody who says that autofocus is not necessary or not for professionals has never used the C200. For shooting myself, for shooting on gimbals or sliders, for interviews, the autofocus is crazy reliable. Maybe I wouldn't rely on it for a super high end, you know, high pressure or, you know, overly planned shoots, but for me, that's not really most of what I'm shooting. For what I shoot, I usually either have a second camera, which can cover if the autofocus messes up on the C200, or I can redo that shoot, or it's just something, it's not all that critical, like these YouTube videos, for example. 
But the bottom line is especially for single shooters, the autofocus on the C200 is amazing. But in most of the cases where I rely on autofocus, it's either talking heads of myself or interviews or things like that. And in most of those cases, I'm more than happy using the EOS R, especially combined with the Atomos. For me, the one reason that I wouldn't use the EOS R in those situations is if I need slow motion. And if I need slow motion, I'm usually not using autofocus anyway. And in that case, the E2 is going to be my go-to camera. And on top of that, I've actually found that the 1080p in the EOS R scales up to 4K really, really well, much better than I expected it to, even coming from the 5D Mark IV. So if I'm in a pinch and I need slow motion with autofocus, then I could just shoot it in 1080p on the EOS R and call it a day. However, in the past two years where I've owned the Canon C200, the amount of times that that has been the case is very, very few. So autofocus was kind of the last thing that I was holding on to keeping the C200, but I've come to the realization that there are just simpler and uh, cheaper alternatives, at least for what I need. So like I said, I don't want to do like a side-by-side -side image comparison because I don't think that really helps anyone. To be completely honest, I just think that these cameras are different cameras for different people or for different jobs. The C200 is an incredible camera with beautiful raw footage, and when you need the most dynamic range or flexibility out of your footage, this is going to give that to you and not break a sweat. On top of that, there are tons of professional features built into the body, both physically and technically speaking. But the footage from the E2 is also really, really flexible, and it looks amazing. The colors and everything are there. The noise performance is really quite impressive, especially for a micro four thirds camera. It's built like a tank. It's small. I mean, it makes it much, much easier to shoot with cheaper and smaller sliders, cheaper and smaller gimbals, and you can rig it up very, very easily into a lot of different configurations. And they do also have Super 35 and full frame options coming and it hasn't had a single bug, it's never crashed on me, it's just been a really reliable camera. It's gonna be cheaper to accessorize, and the lack of NDs is my only real major complaint at this point. However, the E2 F6 is going to have that built in, and also, of course, for the lack of autofocus, I have the EOS R. Just to clarify, I don't think that any of these cameras are better than any of the others, but I just wanted to have this discussion to kind of talk about some of the um, kind of on the surface differences between these cameras and talk about why those differences mean that for me, it's kind of a good time for me to say goodbye to my baby, unfortunately, and invest that money a little bit more wisely into a second EOS R, an Atomos monitor recorder, and in the future when it is released, an E2 F6. I think those will benefit my personal use and my professional use a lot more for the money. So like I said, I will have a lot more content coming about the E2 and the F6 when it's released. So if you want to see more of that, be sure to subscribe and hit that little bell icon to get notifications when all that content is uploaded. If you have any questions or comments, let me know down below. If you think I'm stupid, let me know down below. And if you agree, let me know down below or tell me what you think is one of the best cameras on the market today, you know, budget versus power wise, I guess you could say. There are a lot of options and these are far from the only ones. So I'm curious to see what everybody else is using and what you think of uh, how it stacks up to maybe what I'm working with here. So in any case, this is kind of a bittersweet day for me, kind of making this official by announcing it on the internet. Now I can't take it back. So once again, if you have any questions or comments, leave that down below. And if you want to see links for all of this, check the video description. As always, thank you for watching.